Hey, I'm Bryce, uh, and this is the story of me and my friend Mario. Uh, he was a good friend of mine, and so because of that, uh, I had a deep desire to see him grow in a relationship with Jesus Christ, and I really wanted to bring him to Beach Church. So Bryce, his wife, Allie, um, was friends with my brother through work. They were work proximity associates, and they used to go to events all the time, and Dave, my brother Dave, would invite me out, and I always kind of felt like an outsider, and I started to go to all these events, and I noticed that this one guy stuck out, he had a big beard, like talking about Star Wars and comic books, and I'm like, man, I'm going to get to know this guy because I am also a nerd, and so I approached Bryce kind of privately, away from the group. Yeah. And I was like, hey, man, you're not attached to these people, except for your wife. Except for my wife. <laughs> um, we should get together and do things away from this group that we're not technically in. Right. And um, it really started, we went to, we, like, eat, we did eat around Jacksonville. Yeah. We just went to different restaurants. It was really like chain restaurants, really, though. Yeah. It was just, well, not always chains. Well, we went to like Taco Bell, <laughs> Freddy's. That's all we need to do. Yeah, so... Yeah, so, you know, we started going on lunch dates, started hanging out more. Um, I love that you call them dates, by the way. They were. Okay. Uh, so we started hanging out more, um, started playing sports together. We started playing soccer and football, uh, and we started working out together because I'm in terrible shape and Mario's in great shape, so he was like, hey, I'm going to help you get in better shape. You're, you've come a long way. Thanks. It didn't really pan out. Um, <laughs> uh, Still, it's so a work in progress. It was one of those things where... Uh, we were going to the gym, and so I had to tell him, like, hey, um, probably won't be able to meet you on Tuesday nights most nights because that's when I have my church life group. And so Mario was like, oh, that's fine. Is it okay if I come? And I was like, yeah, sure. I think you said, wow, <laughs> aggressive much? Boundaries. Well, I think just one thing about inviting people to church or to life group is it makes you, like, care a lot more about what we do at church <laughs> in a very different way. Just because in my mind, I'm like, please let nothing weird or strange happen this week. Like, my, my, Mario mentioned that he's like, everybody seemed normal. And that was the goal. That was the the roof did shake. <laughs> yeah, the roof that does was, shake. I thought there was rain. It, it will never stop shaking. Yeah. Um, Santa's but, here. That's what I thought. <laughs> but you want everybody to act normal and be normal. And so, like, it makes you invested in the church in, in such a way of, like, so often, like, we go to meetings and we talk about what the church should look like. And it's about, like, what we want it to look like. But in that moment, all I cared about was what does that look like to my friend who's sitting next to me? Uh, and so a funny thing that's happened is uh, Mario, being a relative outsider of Beach, has pointed out a lot of the things that we do that are traditions uh, that seem a little bit strange to an outsider sometimes. Yeah. And so it's been fun to kind of talk through that and, and to challenge me on like, why do we do those things? Yeah. So this experience for me coming to Beach and being part of this, this church community has really opened my eyes to like wanting to invite more people, uh, not only to church, but just to get to know Christ and have a relationship with God. Um, it's not something that I ever envisioned myself ever wanting or being able to do, but now that I've become so acclimated, I feel like in watching Bryce lead Life Group and how he's kind of led me to Beach, I feel like I have the ability to do that one day. Um, it's funny, you kind of get a new sense of confidence, like people have come up to Bryce and I and say, you guys are the best friends I've ever seen. No one is closer than you guys and no one even touches it. And you know, it's their words, not mine. Um, but I really feel like <laughs> I can foster that relationship with someone where you can get them comfortable enough to say, hey, you know, these are cool regular guys that have this awesome relationship with God. And uh, I, I want to give that a try as well. And, and it's impacted my life in such an awesome way. And to be able to share that with someone else one day is something that I, I really hope to be able to accomplish be courageous enough to make the ask and to say hey would you like to come to church with me and offer to buy them lunch afterwards because that works i think you made me pay for you though i did no yeah. you didn't pay for me <laughs> you paid for yourself no i'm pretty sure you said hey man you can come to church but you gotta pay and i thought that was weird <laughs> but you promised me a lifetime of happiness so oh my gosh I so love that video for so many reasons. But um, hey, welcome to Beach. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 5 to start with um, in the New Testament. And uh, if we've never met, my name is Jerry, and I'm one of the pastors here at Beach. We're so excited for you to be here for week two 
of our series, Everyone Has One. And, and this whole series is really about relationships and how we build relationships with people and do what, what God has called us to do, and that is to point people uh, to Jesus through our relationships. And that everyone has at least one person in your life who, who maybe is, is far from God, but yet close to you. And so this is what this series is all about. Last week, we talked about praying um, for the relationships in our lives and for people that might not have a relationship with God and how God would change hearts uh, through our relationships. This week, we wanna talk about investing in relationships with people, just like uh, Bryce and Mario in this video. And uh, so we're gonna be going after that today. But before we do that, um, uh, Bryce was talking on the video about how sometimes we do things at church that seem weird or seem like they don't make sense. So I thought today I would just address one of those. So for some of you, I know at times after we built Sago Coffee, you're like, how does my church that always says the most important thing to do is to point people to Jesus. That's the whole reason we exist. And yet we build a coffee shop without a picture of Jesus without a cross and without a Bible verse, anywhere over at Sega. And here's the reason. You know who goes to a church coffee shop? Church people. And our intent is that we wanted to create a space that was true to the heart of beach. Like that place over there reflects our heart for relationships. It, it, it really reflects our heart to pour back into our community. And so uh, what we are believing God for is that there will be people that show up at Sago that might not ever darken the doors of this church. But we have created a space over there that exemplifies some of the best aspects of our church. And we believe that God will work around a cup of coffee and conversations among friends, that we will hear stories within the years to come of people who have come to know Jesus simply because it started in a conversation over a cup of coffee at Sago. So that's why we do what we do. Just wanted to make sure you knew that. So let's, uh, let's pray and then we'll jump into the message. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. As we talk about investing in relationships today, there has been no greater, more costly investment than what you did on our behalf that you so loved the world that Jesus came and that through his life, death, and resurrection revealed your heart for each and every human being on this planet. And God is, for those of us that have been impacted by the relationship with Jesus that has impacted our lives in such a powerful way and given us a new future and a new eternity, may we remember what it means to invest our lives in the hearts and lives of others so that all might come to know the hope that one can have through Christ. We pray this in his name, amen. So let me first of all begin by giving you three kind of reasons why I think this series is so important. We try to do this series every year, and um, here's why. The first reason is because, <clears throat> think about this. Jesus left the glories of heaven where there is no pain, there is no sorrow, there is no suffering. He willingly came into a very broken and hopeless world where he was willing to not only be rejected and betrayed, but also ultimately, he gave his life to be brutally slaughtered on a Roman cross so that you and I had the potential to have a relationship with God. When divine blood is spilt on a cross, I think that's a pretty important deal and he did it not just, to, not just that we would come to know him, but that every single other person in our life would come to know the same hope and freedom in their lives as well through Christ. The second reason why I think this series is so important, um, if, if you think about it, 
There's this uh, phrase that I heard one time Andy Stanley give, and he said this. He said, he talked about the 100-year question. He said, in 100 years from now, the only question that will matter in your life and mine is not how big a bank account did you have, how big a house did you live in, how successful a career did you have, or what was your best golf score. All those things, you know, important, fun, great, but None of those questions will be a question that is important 100 years from now, right? Because all that just goes with you. Maybe one more generation. But the one question that impacts all of eternity that we so often don't pursue is, do we have and do the people that we love and care for in our lives have a relationship with Jesus? Because that's the only question that matters 100 years from now. So why would we not, in the midst of all the other things we do in life, be pursuing what it means to help people come to know Jesus? The third reason is just a very practical reason. We live, guys, in a world of hopelessness and despair. There's a lot of brokenness in this community and in our world. Psychology Today um, had an article where they said basically that we live in a day where there is an epidemic of hopelessness that prevails over our culture. Last year in 2018, the number one cause of death in the Beaches community was suicide, not natural causes. The number two reason was drug overdoses. So when it comes to talking about how do we help people come to know hope, for many of us in the room that have placed our hope in Jesus, it doesn't mean we're perfect people or that we have it all together or have all the answers. It just means through the ups and downs and and the, the wins and the losses of life, we have an anchor of hope that is secure in Jesus. So why would we not share that with others through our words and our actions. They may show up in your life with smiles and act like they have it all together, but the facts bear out that our culture is dying of hopelessness. So you and I have an opportunity to impact that. I hope that makes sense. That's why we would do a series like this. And so what I wanna do today is kind of talk a little bit about investing in relationships for the sake of people coming to know Jesus. Uh, Let me first of all give you an example of what that looks like. So I grew up in this neighborhood right over in Arlington and uh, I had a friend by the name of Mark and we grew up together ever since we were just little kids. We grew up in the same neighborhood, just a few houses down from each other. And uh, we should have never become friends because like Mark, like, like I wasn't really, my family, Christmas and Easter, that kind of thing, you know, church, kind of go every once in a while, but not really in it. And uh, Mark's mom worked at the church. So he was like a professional Christian, right? And his mom was, and, you know, he was all in when it came to church life. And not only that, like Mark, Mark hated sports, and I loved sports. Mark loved board games. I hated board games. So, but we lived you know, just a few doors down. We just got to know each other and we, you know, we played together. We got in trouble together. We had fun together. We laughed, we cried, you know, we did. It was just over a a period of about 15 years. And uh, then when Mark got into uh, teenage years, um, he got into the student ministry of his church and uh, he started putting on a full court press to get me to go to student ministry, of which I had zero interest. And, um, but he just was so persistent and he had, he had invested so much in our relationship over the years. I trusted him, you know, I loved him as a friend and he just kept in, inviting me. And finally, one day I just decided, I'm gonna get this guy off my back. I'm just gonna go, right? Just show up. And I had no intentions of ever going back. And that first night in that little small student ministry, I would have never known that my whole life, future, and eternity would be changed. 
as I began that journey through that little student ministry and where God took me changed everything about my life and my eternity. That's investing in a relationship with people so that they might come to know the love of Jesus for their own lives. Let me give you a working definition of what I mean by investing in relationships for the sake of Christ. I will intentionally live out Jesus' kind of love in the everyday places and everyday activities of my everyday relationships. In other words, this is not about a bumper sticker. It's not about what I put on social media. It's not about wearing the Christian t-shirt. Ultimately, it's about investing in relationships with people who maybe don't have a relationship with Jesus and where God might take those loving relationships as we pray for the people's lives in which we're invested in. Um, There are three scriptures I want to give you today. It's a little different. We usually take one scripture and go with that, but we're going to do three different scriptures today. And I want to, I just think it reveals three very important thoughts that if we're going to invest what that means for you and for me. So here's the first one, Luke 5. I, I called your attention to at the beginning, Luke 5, beginning at verse 27. The context of this story, if you read at the very beginning of chapter 5, Jesus always did his best work away from the church. In other words, where Jesus taught, where he performed most of his miracles in the Bible, almost all of it was off church property or out of the synagogues. It it was in the regular, ordinary, everyday places of life. So Jesus is walking along the shores of Galilee by the fishing docks and he notices some weary fishermen who have just come back in from a fish expedition all night long, they caught nothing. And so Jesus convinces them to get back in their boats with their nets that have already been cleaned, they're ready to go home, convinces them to get back in their boats, to push out into the deep waters. And there, the son of a carpenter tells professional fishermen how to fish. And they throw their nets out and they catch the mother load of all fish catches. And they bring them back. They've got them counted. I mean, this is like heyday. This is like the best day ever. And then Jesus says, as much as you've caught here today, I want to invite you on a different kind of adventure. I want you to join me in going out into the world and reaching people for a relationship with God. They left everything and they followed him. What's interesting is like the people that they started reaching. So the very first person they reached was a person that was considered untouchable in those days. It was a person that had contracted leprosy. In those days, if you contracted leprosy, it meant you lost your family, you lost your job, you lost your future, you were relegated to a small community outside of the normal community where everybody else lived, where you basically just begged for the scraps of people and then body parts started falling off and then you died. The first person that Jesus took his disciples to reach was someone that no one else would even come close to. That right there reflects the heart of God for all people. And then they leave from there. Jesus is doing a Bible study one day for all the religious people. And all of a sudden, these people tore open the roof above Jesus and lowered down the crippled body of their friend so that their friend could could meet Jesus. The second person that Jesus reached was was this person that had been brought in by this obnoxious group of people who tore a man's roof open and interrupted a perfectly good Bible study. Isn't it interesting that the next people that Jesus reached were people that probably would feel extremely uncomfortable to be in this church or to be in any church? 
And yet people that would probably not know any kind of secret handshakes or any Christian words or anything, they just had a friend that needed to get to this man who could help him. Once again, that reveals the heart of God for all people. And then the third one was, was they had no idea. The disciples, the, some of those fishermen that had gone along on the journey with Jesus thought, I can't believe these are not the kinds of people we thought we would be reaching. Because Jesus turns into a tax collector's office. Tax collectors were the most hated people in that day. Nobody liked tax collectors. Because not only were they filthy rich, they were doing it by using the Romans, which nobody liked the Romans, in order to get people's money. And then they would just charge them whatever they wanted. It was basically, they were extortionists and everybody hated them. And Jesus says, not only does he go in and visit with this guy named Levi, he basically says, oh yeah, guys, he's gonna be on our team. And then this happens, which, which is where I wanna focus in on the point, uh, our first truth here. Verse 27, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting in his tax off booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Then Levi had a great banquet for Jesus at his house and he invited all of his church friends and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the church people, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to the disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered him, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come to call, not to call the righteous, but sinners to Repentance. Note this, this is kind of the first big idea. Note this, Jesus was condemned by church people for doing life with people who did not know God. I think if the Son of God did that, it might be something we should consider. So I wanna raise the question as a part of what does it mean to invest with people? Who do you eat and drink with? Who do you eat and drink with? You see, eating and drinking is an everyday activity, right? You show up and do that probably two to three times a day. And yet, who do we spend that time with? Back in Jesus' day, if you opened your home up to someone for a meal, or, or you invited someone over, or you were invited by someone, that was the ultimate sign of trust. That said, you means so much to me and, and I trust you completely. It was a big deal to invite someone over to your house to eat. It still is, right? I mean, who do you have over? People you care about, people whose lives you wanna share in. When you invite someone out for a meal, that's a big deal, right? Because meals are a part of the everyday stuff that we do, but, but we don't just go out and eat with everybody, but we do with people that we really care about. And so Jesus is, is basically condemned for spending time with people who are far from God. And so in this story, you can be one or the other. You can be um, the religious folk off to the side who are, who are kind of complaining about Jesus and the disciples spending time with people far from God? Or you can be Jesus and be like Jesus and the disciples and be investing in relationships, doing life with people who, are, who need Jesus. You see, the truth is you're always gonna have uh, religious people along the sidelines who are gonna shake their heads. Why in the world would you go out with them? Why in the world would you have a relationship with them? If they did it to Jesus, they're gonna do it to you as well. And yet, this is how we get, this is how Jesus uses life-on-life -life relationships to impact others with the love of God. I thought about this question for myself. 
If it were a crime to do life with people who don't have a relationship with Jesus, would there be evidence to convict you? Because here's the truth. I can sit up here all day with a mic and be the professional Christian and tell you to invest in relationships with others for the sake of Jesus. But the truth is, the key is not what I do up here on stage. It's what I do when I go out there. And a key question, if you really wanna get down to everyday activities with you know, everyday places, with everyday people, who are we eating and drinking with? And what would it mean to move outside of our comfort zone to have a relationship with someone who doesn't know Jesus and just begin to build a relationship like Mark did in my life those many years ago. Here, here's something that I put in my notes. You will reach 0% of the people you do not invest in. I know it doesn't may, it's not correct grammatically, but it's true. We'll never reach anybody that we don't invest in. So Jesus was the perfect example of what it means to move beyond the church walls. I love this quote by a guy named Joel Nobis. He said this, I believe churches are meant for praising God, but so are 2 a.m. car rides, showers, coffee shops, the gym, conversations with friends, strangers, etc. Don't let a building confine your faith because you will never change the world by just going to church. We need to be the church. Second scripture, Colossians 4, verses five and six. <clears throat> Paul is writing to a community of believers. Here's what he's doing. He's giving them practical advice and teaching over how do you live out your Christian faith in the everyday places of life. Note what he gives them instructions on. How, how do you follow Jesus in marriage? How do you follow Jesus in parenting? How do you follow Jesus in your workplace? And then this fourth one, how do you follow Jesus when it comes to relationships with those outside of the faith? So it's, it's like an automatic assumption with Paul that just like you know, family life, just like parenting, just like your job, having relationships with people outside of the faith should be a very normal and real part of our lives. And so here's what he says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So I wanna break that down in just a couple of parts there. First of all, Paul says, if you wanna be wise in the way you're acting towards outsiders, then let your conversations always be full of grace. You know what grace is? Grace is unmerited favor. In other words, we didn't, when we were at our worst, God gave his best. When we had nothing to offer, God gave his everything. It is this unmerited kind of unconditional love that Jesus had for us that we are called to have for those who do not yet know him. That our conversations, our relationships would always exemplify that love of Jesus. I love this quote by Kyle Eidelman. He said, when people begin to witness our compassion, they will begin to care about our convictions. You see, the saying is true. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So one of the greatest ways that we leverage relationships for the sake of people knowing Jesus is through the way in which we love and care for people like Jesus' love for us. You see, the unconditional love of Jesus always opens conversations about Jesus. That's the way it's intended to be. In fact, I know sometimes we talk about being for the beaches and you heard Pastor Kerry talk about being for the beaches. We go out and we serve that, that uh, we don't want to be a church 
known for what we're against, but we wanna be a church that's known for, for who we're for. And because God is for people, we are for people. But sometimes I think we grow a little accustomed to for the beaches living as an Instagram post. Here's the truth. For the beaches does not live on Instagram. If it's gonna live, it needs to live in your heart and in my heart in the way in which we live among people who don't know Jesus. People respond to being valued, loved, accepted, and encouraged. If you wanna impact the world for Jesus, do that. Do that. Then Paul goes into this thing about season with salt. Are you doing a recipe here, Paul, or what? What's this all about? And, and, and what he's talking about, there are many different interpretations of what salt as a metaphor means in Scripture. <clears throat> I choose to, to fall on the side of salt, what it's always been used for, and that salt has always been used to add flavor to whatever it is you know, you're eating, right? To add flavor. Nothing worse than something that has no flavor at all, right? And there's nothing worse than a Christ follower living a very unattractive, flavorless life. See, I think what Paul is after here is, is he wants us to understand that, that when we live, are we living in our relationships in such a way that people thirst for what the why behind the way we live our lives? Are we, is there something about our lives that, that are attractive that, that makes a person who doesn't know Jesus want to know the why behind why you live your life the way you do? And I think there are at least two things that I think are so vitally important when it comes to what does it mean to live an attractive life around people who don't believe in Jesus? The first one is Humility. Are we humble in our walk of faith? There's nothing more attractive than an arrogant, pride-filled Christian who's a know-it-all, that thinks they have all the answers, and they're always pointing the fingers at people, always condemning and judging people who don't even believe what they believe in. It's so unattractive. How did we ever think that we could come off that way with non-believing people and somehow lead someone to the love of Jesus? They don't want to have any part to do with people that live that way. You see, at the heart of this is when we live lives of humility, that means I'm not all that at all, but Jesus is. When we live humble lives, it means that we're saying that, that um, I didn't earn anything with my life. Like I'm not some, you know, perfect person that, that has it all together. No, I, I just have a perfect savior who saved my wrecked life and, and a lot of the brokenness in my life. And he gave me a new start and a new hope and he forgave me of my, of my junk and my brokenness and gave me a new start on life. That's humility. Humility says that, especially in our conversations, humility says this, I will not judge you or condemn you. I will not speak condescendingly to you. I will not preach at you or tell you what you need to do. You see, Jesus came as a humble servant. The Messiah, the Son of God, came as a humble servant. Why would we not do likewise? I think sometimes pride and arrogance and our judgmental attitudes, because people don't look and act like we do, is that we get in the way of the cross. People can no longer see the huge investment God made on their behalf at the cross because we're standing in front of it. And that's what pride can do. And so humility is one of the most beautiful positions and postures of the heart that we can take into relationships with people that we love. The second one is honesty. Now by honesty, I don't mean like telling the truth, although you should do that as a follower of Jesus, like never tell a lie, that kind of thing. 
tell the truth. But here's what I mean by that. Honesty and being real. Because I think sometimes as Christians, we want to come off as polished and perfect know-it-alls. Like we have all the answers. You know, if you just do like me, your life will be great. And, And we come off with this kind of perfectionist perspective and no one's buying it. No one. But here's what people do buy into. Can you be real with me? Can you be honest? Can you just, you know, put down your guardedness and just talk to me? Like, do you even know what it means to live in the real world? You know, when we, when we connect with people, it means that we, we connect at places that are real to them. It means instead of like coming off like you have all the answers every once in a while, just saying, I really, you know, that one, I struggle with that one too. I hope one day I find the answer to that. But in the meantime, I'm just kind of trusting God that, to fill in the blanks even when I don't have the answers. It means coming alongside people in their brokenness and, and not saying, well, you just... Pray that away, just kind of pray it all away and everything will be perfectly fine. And I say, I hurt for you in this place of brokenness. Can we empathize with people long enough for them to see we have a heart that's actually soft and can be vulnerable to some of the broken places they stand in right now? You know, when it comes to honesty, can we be real and talk real language with people? Like, I have a friend, he loves Jesus, y'all. But I'm gonna tell you, everything he posts on Facebook, every time you have a conversation with him, it's like I'm talking with the Bible or I'm talking with, with this guy that, that speaks Christianese, like all he knows how to do and everything is praise the Lord. Everything is Maranatha, come Lord Jesus and all these, and, and it, I get it, and that might be some of you in here. I don't know, but, but I mean, here's the thing. Everybody's just kind of like, this is just weird to me. I mean, when you go to work, can you be real with people? When you're in school, can you be real? Can, can people know you're not some alien from another planet? You actually live in the same plan, on the same planet as them? I mean, honesty and real are beautiful when it comes to how we best connect with people who are far from Jesus. Now, they wanna know the hope that you found, but sometimes we just kinda, once again, conceal the investment God has made on their behalf when we try to come off like we got it all together and we, we know everything. Can we be honest and real with people? Beautiful ways in which we have an attractive life that, that leads people to actually want to know more about the why behind our living. And then finally, this last scripture. This comes from Ecclesiastes. It's kind of a different passage, but I've always loved this. It gives me a picture of what happens when we invest in people. Ecclesiastes 11, 5, and 6. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in your mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. In other words, there are things about God you'll never understand. And and let me tell you one of them, the human heart. We can't even make sense of our own hearts, much less the hearts of those we want to invest in. Only God can change the heart. He calls us to be messengers, not the ones who change people's hearts. Only God can do that. And so if we don't even know but that much of who God is and what God has done, how can we ever begin to think we got it all together and we know how to reach people and we know how how this all is gonna work out? Because the truth is you invest in people, it's messy and it's complicated and there's always drama and there's always gonna be issues and there are always gonna be things that brush you the wrong way because of your beliefs and yet it's important that we hang in there with people and keep planting seeds. Here's what he says. You can't understand all of how it's all going to work out, but here's what you can do. Sow your seed in the morning and at evening, let your hands not be idle for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both 
will do equally well. In other words, we don't have it all figured out, but here's what we do know. Plant a seed. Plant a seed. Plant a seed. It's kind of like my wife and I started doing this um, uh, with some of our other friends in the neighborhood that go to beach. We started doing this Christmas party. Um, and because we felt like we were crappy neighbors, like we just drive into our garage and we didn't have a little kid and we didn't have a little dog or a cat or something to meet other people. And so we basically just weren't connecting with our neighbors. So we started this Christmas party where we just bring everybody together and, you know, eat and drink together. And, uh, and I know some of you are saying, Jerry, that's so lame. That's a one and done deal. But here's what I decided to do. I can plant a seed. I don't know what will become of that Christmas party or what will happen as a result of that. But I know I'm planting a seed, planting a seed, planting a seed. My friend Pookie, who usually joins me on the, the front row uh, every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, um, she wrote this in her, we met at um, uh, the gym together and working out and just kind of got to know her story and everything. And uh, she put this on Facebook the other day, which I absolutely loved. Talking about planting seeds, she put this. She said, my life was changed three years ago because a dear friend said, come sit with me. Come sit with me. Kindness is not about the size of the action, but by the magnitude of the impact. And you will never know the, the magnitude of a simple act of kindness, a seed planted. That's what Mark did in my life for years and years and years. He just kept planting seeds of encouragement and kindness and love and support and standing with me in times of need. He, can't pl he kept planting seeds, never knew where this all would turn out. And so my hope and my prayer is that every single one of us would be a mark in somebody else's story where their lives were changed because you and me, we chose to invest in such a way that it impacted their future and their eternity because we cared enough about their life to invest in the relationship for the sake of Jesus. So as we finish today, <clears throat> I don't know where this lands with you. Um, maybe for some of us today, it's just you ask yourself the question, who am I eating and drinking with? And is anybody on that list someone who needs Jesus but doesn't know his love for them yet? And what might it do for me to add a little space in my calendar to invest in one relationship with someone close to me, far from God. Another thing for some of us might be, maybe you just need to ask God an honest question. Does my life look more like your grace or does it look more like judgment and a condescending attitude towards people that are different from me? Am I known for more of what I'm against instead of what I'm for? God, what, what would you do in my heart to soften my heart to just like you loved me into eternity, I could love someone else and point them to that same love that would change their eternity. Maybe for some of us, it's, we need for, for God just to break our hearts and give us humility again. I think when we came to know Jesus, we were humble because we knew we didn't do anything to deserve what he did for us. And freely we had been given something that came at cost to God. And we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, we were humbled to be the recipient of what God had given us. And somewhere along the way, we begin to lose that. And we begin to forget that there are people just like us that, that need to experience the love of Jesus and his grace. And maybe for you, it's God, would you just help me to get back to that place of humility again? Or maybe for you, it's help me to be more honest and real with the people I'm investing in. That they really get a picture that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the same 
deal with them. And that together, you know, we can look to a source of hope that is a true and lasting source of hope. And maybe for some of us this today is just to pray, God, how can you help me plant one seed in one relationship today that will bring someone closer to know your love for them? Maybe that's your prayer. All I know is that I believe that God is longing to raise up a generation of people from this body and from bodies all, uh, from churches all over this community raising up people who will be real and honest and exemplify humility and most importantly, the love and the grace of Jesus to 85,000 persons in this community who do not have a relationship with the Lord. And I pray that God raises us up in our generation to be those kinds of people who win countless people to a hope in Jesus. And for some of us, as we finish today, I just want to invite some of us maybe that have never realized how much of an investment Jesus made on our behalf. Maybe for some of you here today, all you've ever heard from churches and people in your life was condemnation and judgment. And here's what I want you to hear. We are personally sorry that that has been the expression of Jesus that you've experienced in your journey of life. What I want you to hear is even though the Bible says, even though man is sometimes faithless, God will always be faithful in what he has already done through the cross of Jesus on your behalf and through his resurrection. He has made a huge investment that you might come to know his love for you. Don't let anything or anybody stop you from embracing the gift that's already been given on your behalf. So I want to invite us all, if you would, to close your eyes for just a moment. And if that's you, maybe for the very first time you've, you've heard about what God has done on your behalf that you've never known. And maybe for the very first time the light bulb has come on and you, you want to place your trust in the one who has been pursuing you and loves you and has done much that you might come to have a relationship with him. If that's you, I'm gonna count to three. And when I do, if you would just slip your hand up in the room that I could be able to see where you are. And then I wanna invite you just in your own heart to make this your prayer um, as you personalize your trust in Jesus today. If you want that and you've never made that decision before to trust Jesus for your life, the count of three, just raise your hand. One, God loves you. Two, God is for you. Three, just lift your hand that I can see where you are in the room. I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you that the ultimate investment of your love in my life was at the cross where Jesus died for the forgiveness of my sins for me to have a different future and a different eternity. Today, I place my trust in you. Be the Savior and Lord of my life. Do in me what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made that your prayer today, I wanna encourage you, make sure to tell someone before you leave today. At the back, we have two Connect Centers in this room, and go back there and let one of them know we have a gift for you as you begin that journey of faith. We'd love to be able to share that with you and hear of your most important decision you made today. I want to invite us to stand now as we worship. And don't allow this last song to be anything but an opportunity to respond to what God has laid on your heart this morning.